Okay, all right, let's start. Um, introduce myself, my name's Alex Herber. I'm one of the senior partners at Holborn. Um, firstly, I'd like to uh, thank everybody for their time today, wherever you are in the world. I know if you're over in Asia, it's an afternoon. If you're in Europe, it's the morning. Um, if you're in Cyprus, there's about 10 of you in a room. I can see you all, which is great. Um, I've been running loads of webinars over the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. And I must say, this is probably the one, definitely the one that I've been most excited about. Um, I do enjoy webinars. I do list, like listening to our asset managers, who I'm going to introduce you to in a minute. Um, but to, to have uh, Bernard Gallagher and Ian Carter today is really exciting for those of us that enjoy golf. Um, what I will say is we're going to have a Q&A session at the end, guys. So if you, know, if you notice at the bottom of your Zoom, Zoom accounts, you have a Q&A tab. Please feel free to type your questions in there as we go along. Um, should take about 45 minutes um, and then we'll spend 15 minutes with Q&A at the end. Um, I'd also like to thank, obviously, Jeremy and the guys at Tilney Smith and Williamson for putting this together. Uh, they've put a lot of effort in getting, getting this webinar together, so thanks a lot for your support. And I'll pass you over to Jeremy, who will introduce himself and the speakers properly. Cheers, guys. Thanks, Alex. I'm not on the screen yet. I don't think everyone can see me. They can hear you. They can hear you. Okay, <laughs> right. Well, you'll have to mouth the words as I speak them, and then uh, it'll look <clears throat> easy. Um, so if you can hear me, so I'm, I'm Jeremy or Jez um, at Tilney Smith & Williamson. With me, with me, I've got Chris Golding, who um, is a, an investment manager in our um, Jersey office. So this, this is a first of what we hope to be a series of online events like this, uh, less CPD, more fun um, to, to talk through uh, the, the events as we go through the sporting year. So um, Ian's helping us, uh, kindly helping us with this for golf, because Ian's a, the BBC uh, Five Live golf correspondent. Um, and um, Ian and I have known each other for a little while, and Bernard's kindly agreed to come along and, and give us a bit of background to the event. Um, and with Chris, uh, because Chris represents the uh, international um, investment management business for Tilney Smith & Williamson, with whom uh, many of you will have, will have already spoken and hopefully more will speak with us, um, we will be uh, co-hosting some more events. Yes, I think, um, exactly. Uh, Chris is probably a bit more sporty than I, so I'm going to put you on the spot and come up with a list of events we're going to be doing. But anyway, so that's that's a bit about me. So I'm in, I'm in distribution, uh, Morris Keane and, and Eric uh, Collins. Um, so you'll hear quite a bit from us, but that's enough from me. I'll just quickly introduce Chris. Yes, good morning, everyone. And Del Chris Golding here from, from Jersey, but um, here from, delighted to be from the uh, Cyprus office. And uh, yeah, I must admit to being slightly a, a, a golf novice, so looking forward to to knowing more about what's happening between Europe and, and the US. Um, and yeah, and be looking forward to, to more of these events heading forward. And that's it from us. So over to, over to you, Ian, and, and um, I will forward to listen to you. Cheers. Thanks, Jez. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Alex. Um, it's fantastic uh, to, to be here. I, th I think to kick off, I just want to take you back to 2012, uh, nine years ago, and what is known in golfing circles as the miracle at Medina, a golf course just outside Chicago, and Europe had played the United States in the Ryder Cup, and Europe were getting the biggest hammering you could imagine. And on the Saturday, it's played over three days, the Ryder Cup, on the first two days, you have teamed up matches, foursomes and four balls. And then on the Sunday, you have the singles. Well, heading towards the latter stages of that Saturday, Europe were 10-4 down. America needed just four and a half more points from, uh, let's do the maths, 12 more matches to uh, come up with a, a winning score of 14 and a half points. It looked really, really grim. And then Ian Poulter did his stuff, inspired Europe. They came surging back. And they ultimately won 14 and a half points to 13 and a half. For me, I think that was the greatest moment in my broadcasting career, describing the, what happened on that 18th green. Martin Keimer initially uh, holding the putt that meant that Europe retained the trophy and then Francesco Molinari beating the great Tiger Woods in front of my very eyes. But the enduring memory of that day was two things. One, Europe had just won. And away to my left, there were just thousands upon thousands upon thousands of red, white and blue clad Americans just walking straight to the door. It was the most fantastic sight you could imagine. They were done. 
<laughs> on the right hand side, there were pockets of yellow and blue spectators singing Ole, Ole, Ole. And as I sat in our commentary box, which was the best commentary box I've ever had in sport, just hanging over the 18th, there was a gentleman standing just behind the 18th green and he was looking up at me and to the tune of Ole, 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 he was dancing the happiest jig I have ever seen. And that gentleman was Bernard Gallagher, <laughs> who, was working, who was working with us on, on Five Live. But to me, when I saw the sheer joy Bernard that day, that told me everything I needed to know about what the Ryder Cup means to you. Well, it was remarkable. It was a remarkable. I mean, Ian Poulter took the match by the scruff of the neck. We were losing, as you said. Now, the captain had changed the format. R Rory McIlroy and Graham McDowell played in the morning together. And McDowell, in fairness to him, said, well, you know, Rory's much better than me. You need to get another partner for him. Because I was on the course walking around with uh, Jerry McElroy for, for BBC, as you said, and uh, I just said to Jerry, this afternoon, Rory's playing with Ian Poulter, and take it from me, he can hold a few putts for you, <laughs> because they were struggling on the greens. And sure enough, I mean, Ian, McElroy, uh, Ian Poulter won the last five holes on his own, on his own ball, mm. to actually beat the Americans. The greens were... To say they were fast would be an understatement, the Greens. That last putt he hauled on the Saturday afternoon uh, before they came into, which gave the Europeans hope, was downhill from, what, 20 feet. If it didn't hit the middle of the hole, it would not have gone in. And it, and it bottled. And I mean, it was the most fantastic putt I've ever seen from that. And as Ola Thabo said the next day, it gave us some, it gave us hope. It, it, it was a slight chink of light in the team room. And out they came. The opening players played great. And it went down to the last. And as you said, it was the most remarkable recovery to beat the Americans having been four points behind. And, and the thing was, Bernard, that just getting to what the Ryder Cup means to you, you're someone who played in eight of these things. You've been a vice captain and then captain three times. And in the course of this chat, we'll get into some of the stories from, from all of that. But maybe you could just sum up what the Ryder Cup means to you. What, what, how important is it to you? Well, it, it's important to me, mainly because I was brought up at Bathgate Golf Club, which is a small golf club between Edinburgh and Glasgow. And uh, Eric Brown, many people will not have heard of Eric Brown, but Eric Brown came from Bathgate too. And he was a Ryder Cup captain in 1969. He picked me to play in the side. But he had the most marvellous Ryder Cup record. He played in four Ryder Cups and won his four singles. And so I was sort of brought up by the fact that and myself and all the junior section at Bathgate, we wanted to be an Eric Brown. We wanted to be like Eric Brown. We wanted to play in the Ryder Cup. The Ryder Cup meant a lot because you wanted to play against the best players in the world. Uh, you know, we weren't playing for vast sums of money like they play for um, on the PGA Tour, even in the early days back in the late 60s, early 70s. And the only chance you had really to play against the best players was once a year in our Open Championship or in the Ryder Cup every two years. And I wanted to put myself against the best players. So every, every really two years, I would try it that little bit harder to make the team. I wanted to be in a team. I wanted to be in a winning team. I wanted to play against those great players. And that, that it, so it, it meant a lot. I mean, we didn't travel around. We didn't play in America in those days. We had to wait for the great players coming to, to, to Britain. And uh, so I was sort of brought up by the fact that Eric Brown was the first Ryder Cup player uh, from Bathgate, and uh, I wanted to be in his team. When he captained in team in 69, I wanted to be in his team. Now, 1969 was your debut. You were, you were the youngest, weren't you, to, to play for Great Britain and Ireland, as it was then. Um, and that match is always remembered as, as one of great sportsmanship, uh, the concession, Jack Nicholas and giving the putt to Tony Jacklin and the match ended in a, in, in a half. But Bernard, it wasn't quite so friendly, was it, out there? Well, no, it wasn't friendly. I mean, it was, always <laughs> very, it was very friendly towards the end when Jack Nicholas was playing Tony Jacklin. Remember, Tony Jacklin really was the best player in the world. And mm. I was a young 
player mainly because they changed the rules. Because in the in the old rules, you had to be a member of the PGA for five years before you could qualify to play in the PGA. And it was the same in America. So in 1969, Jack Nicklaus was a rookie as well in the American side, but he had already won four majors. So he was, you call him a rookie, yeah. won four majors, and he, you know, he was Jack Nicklaus. But Tony Jacklin had won the Open Championship at Rhythm last year, and we all felt Tony Jacklin at that time was the best player in the world. And, and we felt we had the best player in our team, and it was a big boost. But that's really why I was the youngest player. I mean, Peter Alice and people like that would have played in the Ryder Cup before me and younger than me, except for the rules. But mm. the rules did change. But that match, that match was quite um, awkward from the start. Sam quite Smith, feisty, wasn't it? Very feisty. Uh, uh, Eric Brown was our captain, a very combative type of guy, confrontational, very angry all the time, Eric. And he really got the team fired up. Uh, so you, you, you must remember by 69, we hadn't actually won the Ryder Cup before that since 1957. So the Americans were very dominant, but Eric wanted to change that. And the Americans, you know, of course, wanted to, to beat us over there. Sam Snead was the American captain, one of the great all time great Sam Snead, but you know, a tough guy too. Uh, and Brian Huggett, who played in the team, he and I played Ken Still and Dave Hill in a four ball match. And it was the seventh hole at Royal Birkdale, a short hole. And Dave Hill putted from about 20 feet and putted up to about a foot and a half and continued to putt out. But I was actually lying about four feet away. It was my turn to putt because you, we didn't, it wasn't continual putting. It was match play. Mm -hmm. And so when he continued to putt out, Brian's, Brian Huggett said, you can't do that. You, he said, and, and, and I didn't know what Brian meant. I said, and I was trying to back him up. I said, no, you're right. You can't do that. I wasn't <laughs> sure what couldn't do. But anyway, um, Ken Still, the American player, ran on the green and he was a very highly strong, angry guy, Ken Still. He rang on the green. He said, if that's the way you guys want to play this match, take the hole and take that goddamn cup as well. So Brian said to me, that sounds like a concession. And so he said, go across here, pick up your ball, and let's get off here. And so I, I went across and picked up my ball and claimed the hole. You know, they're giving us the hole. We felt they had given us the hole, con conceded it. And then when he realized what was happening, Ken Brown, he started to backtrack. And he, and he had, he, he then Ken went. Ken Still. Yeah, Ken, Ken Still. And, and of course, then he went to the British referee who hadn't, said anything until then he thought you know let them get on with it <laughs> and he said well I didn't really click give them the hole he said it was a sort of angry moment and uh, it's in the referee the British referee said well what did you say he said well I, I sort of said well if that's the way you want to play take the cup and he sort of mumbled take the hole as well and the British referee said well I'm sorry but you've conceded the hole under the terms under rules of match play so we were now one up. And of course, the, the few Americans that were there were absolutely as angry as hell. And uh, Sam Sneed and Eric Brown were called out to the green by Lord Derby, the president of the British PGA, to sort of calm things down. And so Sam Sneed took his two players off the side of the green and spoke to them. And Eric took us into the middle of the green. Now, Eric, Eric was an angry guy, you know. Eric was a tough guy. He was built like a super middleweight boxer. And he was always liable, you know, to go at the 19th hole after match and have a fight with the members in the bar over anything. I mean, <laughs> it's, I was always a bit intimidated by Eric. And so he, he grabbed me by my sweater in the middle of the green so that everybody could see. And he, he waves his finger at me so that everyone could see what was going on. And he said, good, keep this up. That's exactly <laughs> what So, you know, that, that was Eric's captaincy. And the match got worse as the match went on. And we, we played well. Ken, Ken still couldn't hit a ball after there, but his partner was Dave Hill. And Dave Hill was a superb, immense player. And he beat our best ball, Brian and I's best ball, and we were going along nicely. And he finished us off with an eagle at the 17th at Royal Birkdale, and so we lost that particular match. But uh, that, And so that set the tone for the singles, and eventually the match is remembered, as you say, for Jack Nicholas. Uh, conceding a putt to Tony Jacklin in the last green from about two feet.
Yeah. Which at the time I thought, I must say at the time, I thought it was the greatest sporting gesture I'd ever seen. I was sitting by, I'm just this young guy sitting by the 18th green watching the match finish. And uh, suddenly Tony Jacklin has a putt to win, leaves it short. Jack then holds his five foot putt for a four, picks the ball out the hole, picks Tony's marker up at the same time. Tony said to Tony, he said, uh, Tony, you wouldn't miss that and I'm not going to give you the chance. And, uh, you know, even today, next week, when we go to America, Whistling Straight, they'll still talk about that concession. Because I don't actually think if, I mean, for instance, if it happens, if it happens that somebody's got a two foot putt uh, to save the match, to save them losing, will, will, will it be given by the other side? Mm. I mean, will it be allowed to be given? It'll be interesting to see. But Jack, Jack is... Jack, to me, Jack Nicholas is the, not only just a great player, he's the greatest sportsman that's ever mm. lived, or, as far as I'm concerned. Quick couple of questions off the back of that. You, you said that they said, you know, if you, if you want it, just take the trophy. If you, if you want to be like that, just take the trophy. I'm just looking at the side of your, your shoulder there. You, you, you didn't, did you? <laughs> no. <laughs> no that, trophy, that small trophy here is a trophy that all the players get who participate in, in the Ryder Cup. They give you this, an exact copy of the Ryder Cup, except it's a quarter size. And that's what you're given as a memento. And, and, you know, it's treasured by a lot of... So I've, I've actually got 12 of them. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I've, given, I've given quite a few away. I've given a couple. I've given one to Wentworth, one to Basket. I've given it to some of the golf clubs um, that, I, you know, I'm a member of. It. And uh, it's a nice, it's a nice, it's a nice uh, thing to have. That's wonderful. And and you, you mentioned there, obviously, Jack Nicholas, and and also at that time, how important the Ryder Cup was for you to be able to test yourself against the best. And so, you know, in your playing career, you came up against the likes of Nicholas Palmer, you beat Lee Trevino. I mean, what, what was that like for you as a young pro coming through to play these absolute icons of the game? Um. Well, in, in 1969, I, I didn't play. They played two morning singles in 69. I didn't play in the morning. And Eric Brown came in the afternoon and said, I'm, I'm putting you in this afternoon. You're playing Lee Trevino. But, you know, 20 years old, I thought, great, great opportunity. You've got nothing to lose. Go out and play Lee Trevino. I think he was the US Open champion or so at the time. And, uh, you know, I thought, great. And I got off to a flying start. I was 32 to the turn three or four up and I held on and won four and three and Eric was on the green at the 15th and he, and he grabbed me and uh, he said that was great. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, then then I played Jack Nicholas in 1977 at uh, Royal Lytham in the singles. And, you know, I was very apprehensive about playing Jack Nicholas. I have to say, I didn't sleep much the night before. And I didn't sleep much the night before because, I, you know, I thought I'm, I don't want to let myself down. And, uh, you know, if Jack plays really well, you know, it's difficult to beat. And I, I didn't want to get hammered. I didn't want seven and six. I didn't want six and five. I was quite happy if I could, you know, play moderately good. And, but at the first hole at Royal Lytham, which is an unusual opening hole because it starts with a long par three, as you know, Ian, yeah. usually into the wind. And uh, so Jack Nicholas goes first and he, and, and he hits it up dead on line but just short of the green and, and and I hit my two iron and I sort of made contact and I was delighted just to hit it because I was feeling very nervous and you know in the crowd I felt the crowd were pulling for Jack Nicholas to be honest even although because he's just so popular he goes on the tee he, he got huge crowds around the green and the stands they're all waving to Jack and Jack's waving back because I mean the British public, you know, they love they love Jack Nicholas, they loved Arnold Palmer, they loved Seve Ballesteros, they loved watching them, and you know, they were important to British golfers. And I didn't, I didn't, I felt I felt I was a, an away player, to be honest. And and so Jack <laughs> hits his putt at the chip from the green and he, he left it about four feet short, but I wasn't really bothered really. I, I just saw it out the side of my eye. And I now hit my putt from the back of the green that comes down. And I leave it two feet short downhill, downwind. And I'm really, this is a very difficult putt on the first green. And I'm not looking forward to it. And it was a very painstakingly walk down that green. And I'm urging the ball to get down there dead, get down there dead, but it didn't. And I had to mark it. And then Jack gets over his four foot putt and he misses it. 
And, and, and I'll be honest, the first thing that went through my mind was I can only lose this nine and eight now. So, you know, it was a <laughs> sort of moment. And uh, as he picked his ball up, he picks my marker up and said, you can have that. He gave me my two foot putt down the hill on the first green. I couldn't believe it, actually. Yeah. He, you know, he just gave you, he just gave me it. And, and I won the next three holes and I'm four up after four holes against Jack Nicholas. And, and I should. What goes through your head then? I'm four up again after four against Jack Nicholas. Well, well, you know, my concentration was really good in 77. I was still young, 28 year old. I was, and I was just thinking of me. I wasn't thinking of Jack Nicholas. I was still hitting good shots. I had a great iron shot into the fifth hole, shot hole six feet, but I missed it. The sixth is a par five round the corner. I was on the green in two and Jack wasn't. And I three putted it to give him a half. But after that sixth hole, Jack sort of gets into the match and suddenly I'm two up at the turn. Then I'm one up only. Then Jack holds a long putt at the 16th and we're all square. And, you know, I can see the curtain coming down on me and Tony Jacklin and Tommy Horton sort of are walking up the 17th fairway we talked towards me to sort of give me some uh, some encouragement. And that is the worst thing I wanted, I tell you, <laughs> because I always felt we're just coming out to watch the coup de grace, you know. And uh, so, um, but the 17th, you know, I hit my second just short of the green and I hold this putt from 85 feet. I know it was 85 feet because ITV were doing it in those days and they said it was the longest putt they had ever witnessed on the television and, and Jack was in the bunker and of course uh, he missed his bunker shot he was pretty <laughs> and I won the last hole and so I won the last hole and I beat Jack Nicholas by one hole and 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 so the one thing that I always remember things are never ever and I think this is an old sport is that they never end up as bad as you think I was very nervous uh, but the nervousness uh, sort of concentrated me I played really well I wasn't really having a very good Ryder Cup till then, but I really played well against Jack Nicholas because Jack made me really focus on my game and focus on hitting shots and, and, and being, being good around the greens and home putts and things. And, uh, and, and so, yes, you do, you do need anybody who's listening in here to say that, that everybody gets nervous. Jack Nicholas gets nervous. Jack Nicholas and Tony Jacklin were very nervous playing that last match. When, when they were all square, I was very nervous. And, but somehow you get over it and it, 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 makes you, it makes you do better. That's interesting. He brought the best out of you. And, and, you know, we often discuss why Tiger Woods' record in the Ryder Cup is nowhere near as good as the rest of his, his career. Do you think it's that there is something to that? Your experience with Jack Nicholas is perhaps something that subsequent players have shared when they've taken on Tiger Woods in, in the Ryder Cup? Well, Tiger Woods is an interesting one. It's a bit like Seve, actually. Tiger Woods' record in singles is okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, a few people have beaten him in singles. But Tiger Woods' record in four ball and foursomes is not okay. And it's really not okay because most of the players who play with Tiger are very nervous of Tiger. They're not nervous of the other side. They're nervous of playing with Tiger now, because they play with Tiger every week. And Manuel Pinero told me that, you know, it was difficult to find a Spaniard who would play with Seve because the, Seve, the Spaniards were too nervous playing with Seve. And it wasn't until Pinero stood up and said, I'll play with Seve. And he did at the Belfry in 85. And Se Manuel said to me, he said, I wasn't nervous at all playing with him because really Seve beats them on their own anyway, so it doesn't really matter. <laughs> and uh, then they found Ola Thabo to play with Seve and that was a good combination. And they never really found a suitable partner for Tiger. It was interesting. Funny enough, next week's captain, Steve Stricker, who is a very easygoing guy, and Tiger was very friendly with him. And I think they, they played him together, but it wasn't very successful either. They tried Jim Furyk with Tiger because Jim Furyk's got this funny swing that you know only he can work out and he's, he plays in his own sort of bubble around the course and he's not bothered about Tiger. But it didn't really work out either. But when, when Tiger was on his own, Tiger in the singles was okay. He, he beat most of the players he played against. Mm, but yeah. uh, it's difficult to play with great players. But the funny thing is with Jack Nicklaus, anybody could play with Jack Nicklaus because Jack always calmed his partner down on the first tee. 
He always, no matter whether it was Arnold Palmer, Tom Weisskopf, Bob Murphy or whatever, they all enjoyed playing with Jack because Jack made the effort to calm them down and say, oh, let's have a nice game. I hope you enjoy it. And I hope you, you know, sort of pull me through when I'm not playing well. He'll, he'll probably say that type of thing, Jack Nicholas. Jack, Jack Nicholas is a philosopher as well. He's not the greatest golfer for nothing. It's because he thinks better than anybody else. You, you obviously, you, you played your eight matches and then you became a, a vice captain with, with Tony Jacklin in, in the 1980s. And that was when it all sort of turned round, wasn't it? And, and all of a sudden, because Great Britain and Ireland was then expanded to the whole of Europe to take on America, just at a time when golf was exploding in, in Europe and you had these great superstars like Seve Ballesteros and Nick Faldo and all of these. So what was that like to suddenly be part, part of a campaign that was not only competitive, but suddenly starting to beat the Americans? That, they were great, great days for golf, weren't they, in, in, in Europe and in Britain? Well, Tony Jacklin became captain in 1983. He had uh, retired from competitive golf. And I played in that match as a player. And I could see in the team room that Tony had great respect from the players. He had a different attitude uh, about uh, what you do to prepare to play. It was a more relaxed attitude. And uh, also, Tony, Tony pulled Seve Ballesteros in his side. Seve and Tony were great friends. And uh, it was a journey together. He said that, Tony. He said, Seve, I want you to join me in, on this journey. And at the same time, uh, Tony's captaincy coincided with with a, with a remarkable uh, few players from from Europe, I mean, apart from Seve, there was Nick Faldo, there was Sandy Lyle, there was Ian Woosnam, there was Bernard Langer, the, and then along came Jose, Jose Maria Thabo, uh, and so he had the back the backbone of a very strong side. I mean, they're all about the same age. Sandy Lyle, Nick Faldo, Ian Woosnam, Langer, they're all and Seve, they're all the same age. And so in the past, in the, in the past, if you look back to the Americans with Jack Nicholas and, and Gene Littler and, and all Lee Trevino and Casper and all that, they, they had a very strong side, you know, it was almost unbeatable nucleus to their side. Well, suddenly Tony's, and it didn't quite happen in 83, where we narrowly lost by a point, but you could see in 85, was, the story was going to change because those players were just getting better and better. And of course, that's when uh, the turnaround, the American, uh, the American relinquished reluctantly the trophy to a very resurgent Europe. But Tony, Tony Jacklin had a great enthusiasm for the Ryder Cup. I mean, and a great player. We knew he, we knew he does things. He change, he changes uh, paradigms because I mean, he was the first guy. He was the first guy to win the Open Championship since Max Faulkner when he won in 69. The following year, Tony Jacklin wins the US Open at uh, Hazel Time by seven shots. Mm. I mean, this is a very special player. And of course the players think Tony's very special and good things happen with Tony. He, he, he changes things. And uh, the players went along with, with Tony, but, but in the early days, in 85, then the first time ever Europe won in America was at Jack Nicklaus course, Muirfield Village in 87. And Tony was the captain, Jack Nicholas was the captain. We had a lot of European support there because the European supporters knew something big was going to happen. The team was so strong. And, uh, you know, eventually, and you could, I was now a vice captain with Tony. And although you, I wouldn't call myself a, a vice captain, I was really driving his buggy around the coast. <laughs> I wasn't privy to what went on in the locker room or anything like, not like today's vice captains really? who are very heavily involved in everything. I mean, Podrick Harrington and, and Steve Stricker, when they announced the wild cards, well, I've talked to my vice captains and we've decided, we've decided, Steve Stricker was saying, my, my vice captains and I, we've decided on, there was none of that. It was Tony Jacklin decided, he's the captain. We're mm -hmm. not having any of this passing the buck on to vice captains. You know, <laughs> it's the captain that makes the decision. And that's the way Tony's captaincy was. And basically, that's the way I carried on when I took over from uh, Tony. It was my decision to pick the team. It's nothing to do with the vice captains. But uh, I'd have, you know, you can take their advice and, and things like that, of course, savvy advice and 
that you know it's you who make that decision it's you who put out the foursomes and throw ball partnerships you're the guy who does it but and, to, and tony led that tony was very very strong very assertive and he got through to the players and in 87 they won for the first time in muirfield village i mean that was a tremendous thing to do to to win at jack nicholas's muirfield village golf course in the heartland of america and uh and so, you know, and I think that attitude, Tony, Tony Jacklin laid down the sort of ground rules uh, which have been followed to this day. And I would say that when uh, Bernard Langer was captain uh, back at Oakland Hills and when, whenever it was in 2000 and 2004, I would say that uh, he had the same Tony Jacklin attitude. They had, you know, very positive. Get out there, beat the Americans. You're good enough. If Langer says you're good enough to win, you know, you stick your chest out. Okay, if he says I'm good enough to win, I'll go out and play well. So, so you're, yeah. sorry, I was going to, I was going to say Europe won in, as you say, in 87. 89 was a 14 14 draw. So Europe got to keep the, the, the trophy. The Americans kind of bridled at that, didn't they? They were, they were upset. They never got any credit. It was treated as much as a, a European win, even though it was a, a draw at, at, at the Belfry. I can remember them belly aching about that. Um, <laughs> but then, then you take over as captain and go to Kiowa Island in 1991, which I, th you know, this is the 30th anniversary. I'm sure there are going to be loads of pieces in the newspapers mm -hmm. over the weekend recalling what happened there. That was probably the most dramatic Ryder Cup of all time, and you were right at the heart of it as as a captain. How? First question, how hostile was it to be a European at Kiowa Island that, that week? Well, the, the background to that match was that America had just won the Gulf War. And, and there was a lot of nationalism around. We didn't need any more partisanship at that match to sort of wind up. We, we were an enemy. We weren't, an, we weren't a friend. We were an enemy. We were the enemy at Kiowa Island. And we didn't really know that until the opening day's foursomes, to be honest. We had no inkling that, that the America would come on the tee with Corey Pavin, with battle fatigue hats on, and, you know, this was another war. But you'd already and, had the local DJ ringing you up at four o'clock in the morning and stuff like that, uh, and, you know, waking you up early. Yeah, well, I didn't mind if they, had, if, if they woke me up, but they were waking up the players. And they started, they started with Paul Broadhurst at three and four in the morning as on, on the night of the, on the morning of the tournament, you know, welcome to, it's, it's called beat the enemy. It's called beat the enemy, uh, this all night, this jockey. Um, <laughs> we, we were staying in apartments there because there were no hotels. It was an under, it wasn't, it wasn't fully developed at that time. So we went in hotels and we didn't have a lot of support for that reason as well, even though we wanted, a lot of supporters wanted to go to the match, they couldn't go because there were no hotels at Kew Island. And so the people who came there, the Americans mostly came from Charleston, quite a long way away. And they had, of course, it was packed out and there was a lot of crowds. And, uh, but that, that was the first thing. The first thing was they were going around systematically waking up our players. And it wasn't until the end that we found out that one of the maids were being paid by the disc jockeys by the all night disc jockey being paid to give the number of the apartment to 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 the and they were phoning in yeah. and it, we didn't we didn't stop it until until the singles until the saturday night <laughs> and uh but also so what it did was it sort of wound up the crowd and i would say in 1991 it was the first rider cup where the where the spectators became actively involved in the match they were booing our players when we hold a putt and they were cheering if we missed a putt. And uh, that was going on all the way around. And there was even some suspicion that some of the balls, the Americans' balls hit in the rough were knocked back into playable lies. We couldn't find that. There's supposed to be observers in front, but, you know, uh, I was told, and I'm sure you've heard that, Ian, that, you know, it happened a couple of important times mm. towards the end of the singles. Uh, where balls were, were, were thrown back into play. Hale Irwin's drive at the last? Well, you know... In the de decisive match against Bernhard well, Langer? Yes, he's uh, all square against Bernhard Langer, basically for the Ryder Cup, and Langer hit a great drive as always, and uh, 
he pull hooked his tee shot. Oh, and, right. you know, it looked a bad tee shot to me standing. It looked miles off line. The rough's pretty impenetrable on the left. In fact, anywhere at Key Island, if you get off the fairways, the fairways are pretty generous. But if you get in the rough and he pull hooked it, and when I got up there, he was just lying in the first cut, semi rough. And I thought, well, that's, I, I said, I didn't think it was there. <laughs> hey, I never really thought any. It wasn't until the match had finished and weeks later that I was told that his ball was thrown back in play. Mm. But of course, I don't know what I could have done about it anyway. But, you know, he then, or no, sorry, I think Bernard Langer might have been one down playing the last, so he had to win the last. Mm. And then he ended up making a fiver when and Bernard Langer three putted, which gave them the win mm. instead of us drawing the match and retaining the trophy. But, uh, yeah, it was quite acrimonious from 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 the start, and the ca- Dave Stock and the captain didn't help to calm it down. It was uh, it, it was a uh, it was a it was a it was a difficult baptism for me as a captain, I have to say. Mm. And then and then obviously there was defeat at, at the Belfry two years later, but you were persuaded to to hang on and do Oak Hill in nineteen ninety five. And that- 93, well, 93, you know, I was at home and we were really going well. If you look up the stats, I was looking up the stats, remind myself what happened, you know. Mm-hmm. We were really going well right up until the afternoon, Saturday afternoon four ball. Mm-hmm. And I wanted, we had a we had a big lead going into the four ball. But Seve didn't, Seve was, game was on the, on the, on the turn now. And Seve wouldn't, Seve wouldn't play with all the Thabo in the, in the Saturday afternoon. Which was a you know a shock, shock to me, shock to all the Thabo. He's never done this. Seve always wanted to play, and mm. we tried to persuade him. We stood in the middle of the fairway at the 14th because you've got to put your teams, as you know it, before 12 o'clock, which is one of the difficulties of being a captain when there's still players on the course. They don't, you don't get, they don't finish the match. Then you tell them who's playing. You've got, you've got to sort of preempt and speculate for your players in the afternoon, and you can get it wrong. I got it wrong a few times by putting the wrong players out when I thought their match in the morning would finish early and it goes to the 18th. And then you only get half an hour turnaround time and it, that can be difficult too. And uh, so I'm, I'm sort of remonstrating with Seve more or less on down the 14th at the Belfry. They're, they're two up against Tom Kite and Davis Love and they're going along nicely in the foursomes. And Seve said, I don't want to play this afternoon. I said, but he said, uh, anyway, I want to work on my game for the singles. And so, you know, I had to rejig, rejig the afternoon. I had to put uh, Ole Thabo with, uh, to, uh, with uh, Joachim Hegman, a rookie. And, he, and he, you know, he, he wanted to play with Seve, Ole Thabo. And uh, Seve spent the afternoon on the practice ground. And I have to say that that was really the start of Seve's decline in 1992. Mm. because he started to hit it all over the place. He hasn't mm. always hit it all over the place. There's this, mis- there's this misconception that Seve's always been a bad driver of the ball. Seve's been a great driver of the ball for most of his life. I mean, you don't win what he's done. Five world match plays at Wentworth, t- one of the tightest courses he's going. Mm-hmm. He won five of them. He won, he won two of his Opens at Royal Lytham, which is the tightest of all the Open championship courses and, and people think he won two masters the masters is a difficult driving course in as much as you've got to drive it in certain parts of the fairway to get into the flags mm-hmm. and, and he did that and he sort of won 47 tournaments in europe he won we talk about uh, colin montgomery winning eight, eight european tour order merit said he did that too mm-hmm. I mean, and he, yeah. he maybe didn't win them in a row i think he won six six in a row and a couple later and you don't do that week in and week out driving bad. But when his health declined, his back declined, his driving went off and eventually he, he couldn't hit the ball straight at all. But And so that was a decline. And, uh, and But in 1993, I think uh, we, we struggled to hold on to our lead because Sam Torrance, one of the great players, a great player, he injured his toe in the opening match and he, he didn't play after that. He poisoned his toe couldn't play. Bernard Langer came in having not played for six weeks because of injury and he said, I can't play all the matches. So I couldn't I couldn't put in my strongest team at the very moment I wanted to. Mm. And eventually, eventually we lost, you know, which was a written, and I was so despondent. But eventually they 
Ken Schofield said, well, the guys want you to captain in America. And, I, and Ken persuaded me to take the job on I, for the third time. And I, as it turns out, I'm glad I did. You know, that was that that surely was the, the greatest moment, was it? The, the the victory there, Philip Walton, what Mick Faldo did coming down the, the stretch, making the birdie from or the, making the par from the, the, the thick rough. And just yeah. just to do it in America must have felt fantastic. As well, it, and the funny thing was, Ian, that uh, during lockdown, they showed that singles match on Sky, the whole match singles. Mm. And I sat and watched it and I had never seen it before. I really? was I was. I was with a few matches, sort of key matches, dodging here, dodging there. Mm. And I watched the whole of the singles and I saw stuff that I hadn't seen. And it was great. For instance, I stood on the first tee in all the matches while all the matches went off, walked the first hole with all the matches, you know, and there's like two or three hours between the first match and the 12th match. So the time I get, the time they've all gone off, the matches are well on their way. I now really got to go to the 18th and watch them finish. So mm -hmm. I don't really know what's going on. I mean, I saw Howard Clark's hole in one at the uh, at the 11th, which was absolutely brilliant. Mm -hmm. I saw Mark James how easily he beat uh, Jeff Maggot, uh, which got us really going. And uh, but then, of course, I was there at the 18th to see Nick Faldo when he had this four foot putt to beat uh, Curtis Strange. Now, if Nick holds this putt against Curtis Strange in the last green, it means we can't lose. But we, but we still might not get the Ryder Cup back because it could still be a drawn match. But, and we wanted to take the trophy home and win. And I remember sitting with Leslie, my wife, by the 18th green, and Jane James, Mark James, his wife, and I said, well, you know, if there's one person of all time you would want to hold a four foot putt for your life. It's Nick Faldo. I said, here we have it. And sure enough. Yeah. And 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 then of course Philip Waltz. And that's well, the beauty of the of the Ryder Cup, isn't it? You had on one hand this great superstar Faldo doing his stuff. And then Walton, who was just the archetypal European tour player who actually grabs the final moment and the and the glory there. And that almost sums up what is a unique spirit that you, Europe have it has the superstar even to today you've got your Rory McIlroy on one hand and your Bernd Wiesberger on the other hand well yeah there's a there's a sort of natural harmony about uh, camaraderie esprit de corps call it what you want mm. about the Europeans and I was just thinking today about Steve Stricker's dilemma that he's in with Bruce Kopka and uh, DeChambeau because yeah. they each other's big arguments we know the there. Now, now Stricker's problems are that Steve Stricker next week, he obviously can't play them together. Not only can he not play them together, can they be in the same locker room together, team room together is another matter. He's got to think about his practice matches. Can he put them both into the same practice match? He probably can. And, uh, and so, you know, in practice rounds and practice matches are quite important. You know, you try to mix them up and and put them out and you and then you watch them and you get your vice captains to go with a match to see who's playing well because four people don't play in each series you know it's quite a lot of responsibility for the captain to leave four out and try and try and get it right and uh, so steve stricker's got to think about that and you know steve stricker as i said is is really a nice guy uh, how he comes over is really what he is he's an exceptionally nice guy and maybe maybe he could bang heads together and reconcile them. Because if that could happen, that would put a different uh, dynamic on the Americans next week. If suddenly DeChambeau and Cop Cup were now, I wouldn't say friends, but you know, teammates, they felt like teammates. If Steve Straker could say, you know, I've pulled them together and they say, if I'd say them, They've got to play together. They're prepared to play together and uh, for the team. And, you know, we're, try we're trying to put that behind them. That would be a fantastic captain's uh, to, to do that. That would be the greatest captaincy of all time. But, you know, that would, that, that would, that would put a real different perspective on their side. We'll go to the, the question and answer in, in, in just a moment and we'll get Alex to, to come in with those. And if you've got any questions, use the, the, the chat facility. But I, I guess to preempt one question, which I'm sure everyone will want to know, and that is, Bernard, 
can Europe win this Ryder Cup? What does Padraig Harrington have to do? And, and just following on from what you said there as well, will he be encouraged by the reports that we're seeing in the newspapers today that have come out of America that are saying Bryson DeChambeau has been spending his whole time warming up for a long driving competition rather than getting ready for the Ryder Cup? And Brooks Kepka says it's a bit of a pain in the neck, the Ryder Cup, because you have to go with the team schedule rather than your own schedule, which involves having a, a few naps. So it doesn't sound like these two big personalities are prioritising it for, for the Americans. But it's the overriding question, can, I mean, can Europe do it? Well, yes, they can do it. You know, uh, it, it's going to be difficult. It's a difficult ask. First of all, the course whistling straights. Um, they say they, they, they can get out up to 8,000 yards. That's why DeChambeau's length is going to make a difference. And of course, there's a lot of them hit it big in their side. DJ, Justin Thomas is a long hitter. Bruce Kopka's a long hitter. Tony Finu's a long hitter. You know, Scotty, the new guy, Scheffler is a very long hitter. And they, so they obviously think length is 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 great, but uh, you know, uh, Bruce Co Bruce Kopka is an awkward person. I would I would be pulling him aside as captain and say, you know, you're part of the team. I don't like that attitude that we're coming in here. He said it doesn't do the team in effort any good. Uh, so with any luck, that's disharmony in their side right away. Whereas you get Ian Poulter looking forward to being in the team, Ian Poulter. You've got Lee Westwood, who's been dying to get play his way into the side uh, and affected his play on, on Sunday at the PGA. Sort of, he, I, think Ian, I think Lee Westwood knew he'd have to play his way in because he wasn't going to be picked. Mm. And it really affected him in the back nine and he couldn't. the pressure got to him in the end. Mm. He wanted to play for his 11th, I think it's his 11th appearance. Yeah. I mean, that's Bregan, it's been huge. But he's been struggling with his game since last March, uh, Lee Westwood. And, uh, but he badly wanted to play. But the good thing about Lee Westwood, who's like 47 or 48 year old, doesn't need to play every time. And he's good to have him in the room. You know, he, can, he doesn't, doesn't need to play five matches. But, but uh, the team, team can well, because they've got plenty of guts, the European side. They can hold pucks when, it, when they need it. And they've got plenty of fighting spirit. But, but they'll, they'll need to put a good game as well with that fighting spirit because the Americans are coming in here with a very strong side that's currently exceptionally on form. We know what Morikawa has done. He won the Open Championship. D, DJ, in some ways, is a, is a, is a, DJ is a, a weak link. Mm. I mean, he's had a very poor season, DJ, yeah. compared to the rest. The Chambos had Johnson, yeah. Kopka. If he's not been injured, he's had eight top tens. I've, I've written it down. And J Justin Thomas won the Players' Championships. Had seven top tens this year. Patrick Cantley won the Tour Championship. He's a rookie. Daniel Berger. No one said to Daniel Ber Berger, but he's won four times. And he's had eight top tens. Harris. Nobody's heard of Harris in English over here, but he's he had two PGA wins and two top and eight top tens. Fino won a tournament. The, B the BMW eight top tens. Shufley, well, Olympic champion, eight top tens. Jordan Spieth's not the player he was and never probably will be, but he's, he's but as we saw in the Open Champions at Royal St George's, you know, given half a chance he'll win a major again. Mm -hmm. He might not produce it every week, but his golf's there. And uh, Scott Scheffler, as we, no one knows what he's like, but we'll see him on the PJ Tour and television. He's a very tall guy, very long hitter. He's had eight top tens. So, you know, the good thing about Europe is when, when you're a captain and you feel a bit low if you look at the American side, just look at your side and you see John Ram and you see Rory McIlroy, you see Paul Casey and, you know, people like that inspire captains because these are players that can just take the match by the scruff of the neck. I mean, John Ram is, you know, how pumped up will he be? We saw when he beat Tiger Woods at the Nationale, he, his head, he, he nearly jumped through the clouds. When he beat Tiger Woods, and 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 he's the world's number one player. So the captain, the captain is Patrick Harrington, is going in with the world's with the best player in the world in his side, mm -hmm. and so that's great. And Shane Lowry, uh, Shane Lowry, of course, is a big big occasion player, Open champion, and you know not only was the Open champion Shane Lowry. He didn't come sneak up and win the Open Championship. You know, he had a lead, went home and slept on the lead, which is a difficult thing to do. Came out and with his home crowd, they're all rooting for him and excitable. And all. 
and just won it easy. Mm. And, and, you know, he won the Irish Open as an amateur too. As an amateur, he won at County Louth. He beat Robert Rock in a playoff as an amateur. So, you know, we know how good he is. In fact, in some ways, if I say I would like Nick Faldo to hold my putt for me in the last for the Ryder Cup, I would say I would want Shane Lowry to be in that position. And he, you know, I feel he would be the guy too because he's a big occasion player. So, and, and, and Sergio, Sergio, it's controversial all the time, Sergio, because, you know, he's, he doesn't support the European tour the way other players do. But during the Ryder Cup, he, he does put a big effort in and performs, gives 100%. You're making me believe now, Bernard. You're making me believe. This is good news. I, I, I don't know. Can we bring uh, Alex in? Alex, have we got, uh, have we got some questions from, from the floor? Well, you know what? I think everyone's been listening so intensely for the last 45 minutes. I think they've forgotten to type questions in. Um, <laughs> we have a, we, <laughs> Well, I know I certainly have. Uh, thanks a lot for that, guys. That was, uh, that was awesome. Um, a question from me, though, and hopefully a few people will start to take the lead and, and send some in. Bernard, why do you think the European team have always had that team camaraderie in comparison to the US team that just seem to be a bunch of individuals? Why do you think that is? Well, it's to do with how you play on their respective tours. In the PGA Tour, they, they, they sort of, you, they, they go their separate ways and they stay in separate hotels and things like that. When you play in Europe, you've actually got to, you go almost like on a charter plane every week to the tournament, you stay in the same hotels. And, when, and you gather up in the evening at that hotel and you have dinner together with a few guys. And so there's a natural camaraderie because of the logistics of the European tour and that carries itself into the Ryder Cup that's why they're mm -hmm. friendly and it's for the opposite reasons in America I mean America you, you know you're in the same country the guys have their own hotels they only and you know I've played in America and you know you only see the guys on the practice ground or on the course you play with you don't see them for the rest there's so many hotels around to make their own arrangement. You see, in the European tour, you, you travel around Europe with like the European tours uh, uh, agency, booking agency. Uh, and so you end up on the same flights, the same courtesy cars, the same buses, the same hotels going back and forward. It, it's a much different type of tour. And, and that, that lends itself to it being much more friendly. And uh, that, that, that's what I think anyway, because that's a very good question to see. And I, I've always wondered that myself. And that's, that's the reason I think it, that's, there's this natural friendship. Yeah, that makes sense, makes sense. Um, we've had one in from Chris. Um, it's a good question, actually. What's the underlying issue between Brooks and uh, Deshambo? Well, you say that one, Ian. You're more in touch than me. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it, it goes back to um, the, there was a, an, an issue over slow play in a, mm -hmm. in, in a tournament. Um, gosh, it would be about 18 months ago, some, something like that. And, and it, it degenerated into uh, Deshambo having a, a word with... Kepka had a go about Deshambo's slow play. Deshambo then went to um to uh, Kepka's caddy and said if you if, if he wants to say something to me then he should say it to my face which was ironic because he'd gone to the caddy to 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 say this and then it kind of de degenerated to the point where um I think it was at the US PGA this year uh, at Kiowa Island fun funnily enough and Kepka was about to do an interview on television yeah and, um and um Deshambo came around, clumping around in his, his spikes and was saying something under his breath. And um, Kepka had just been asked his first question and, and just looked and gave this withering look uh, as if to say, and just said, oh, let's do this interview once that idiot's gone by and made it absolutely clear. And, and, and this wasn't, this didn't go out live, but somebody kept the tape and then released it onto, onto uh, Twitter. So that gave fuel to the fire and then it, go, it, it it gathered even more because then fans knew that Brooks hated uh, Bryson so they started yelling uh, Brooksy <laughs> uh, at the memorial tournament and a couple got ejected so then Brooksy went on to 
onto social media and said, "Hey guys, I gather some of you had an early early bath from the from the um, from the golf. You know, get in touch, and I've got a, a crate of beer for you um, as <laughs> as a reward." So so on it on it has gone, and I, I feel a little bit of sympathy now for for Deshambo because he is just trying not to to fuel it any further, and Brooks just loves it, and it just yeah. keeps on going. But how that can be addressed within the team room as bernard was saying you know can it can they practice together can they they certainly can't be partnered together um it's it, it is and and the problem i guess bernard is is that you then get people in the brooks camp and people in the bryson camp and so it can lead to divisions within within the team although i'm not aware of too many players in the bryson camp i must admit well you say that ian but you know Kopka and DJ were big friends before uh, the, the match in France. And they had a punch-up. Well, I think it started with the wives, but eventually got to the fellas. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, they're not best friends anymore. You know, they live quite close to each other. They have practice. They always practice together. They go to the gym together. That's all stopped. And, uh, you know, so Kopka, um, I think he's a tricky guy. And, uh, you know, he tries to play with this macho image that he's got, I can do anything type of thing. And uh, the, he, he, I think he could do with reading a book on humility. <laughs> um, take, they should take Jack Nicholas's book, for instance. I mean, that's the template for how to behave. Just do what Jack Nicholas does. And uh, we've, um, we've, we've opened the floodgates on the questions now, guys. I've got, yeah. <laughs> we've, got, we've got quite a few coming in. Um, I know we've got probably another five, ten minutes with you guys. So I'll, yeah. I'll pick the ones that I think are, 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 are good. Uh, so I apologise if I, I'm unable to ask your question. A uh, question from Sean over in Cyprus. Um, we've all seen the greatest shots ever on YouTube. Tiger Woods fading, etc., etc. What's the greatest ever shot you've witnessed firsthand and the circumstances around it? And did you ever witness anyone playing a shot and think there is no way you can pull this off uh, that we may or may not have seen on footage? Well, let me tell that one, Ian. Yeah, you fire away. The best shot I've ever seen was Seve Ballesteros, and it was at the 10th at the Belfry yeah. in 1985 during the Ryder Cup. The 10th is a par, short par four over a lake. And to get to the green is a carry of over 300 yards. And the instruction from the captain at the time, Trevino, was that uh, the American side would all, all play short of this because you're taking on too big a chance and try, and try to get it onto the green and make a birdie that way. And remember, there was, it was persimmon drivers in those days and it was all a softer ball than it is today. Well, Seve was playing with Manuel in a foursomes match, Manuel Pinero, against Curtis Strange and Kurt, Curtis Strange's partner. And so Seve goes first off the 10th, and as it's from the same tee it is today. Not, they moved it forward for subsequent Ryder Cups, but it was off the back tee. And Seve stood up with his driver, persimmon driver. There's a big tree just short of, on the left-hand side, and he thumped his persimmon-headed driver softball at that tree and faded it into the middle of the green. And no one had taken it, no one could take it on, no one could take it on. And Curtis Strange, who's now going second, hits a seven iron off the tee. And he then, Manuel Pinero said, well, he said, I had two, we had two putts to win. So it was easy. But it was probably unthinkable. Greg Norman never took it on when he played a tournament there. No one ever took it on. And you would never, ever take it on in foursomes either because you put a lot of pressure on your partner. Mm. And it's okay ball having a go knowing you have Pinero behind you hitting short and on the green but but Seve stood up and belted this straight on the middle of the green that that to me and I was there to watch it and uh, it, that was without a doubt it was breathtaking it was breathtaking that shot and uh, but of course there's tons of Tiger Woods yeah. shots that people have seen tons of Jack Nicholas shots um, but that stands out to me and it still yeah. stands out to me. and I very I very quick Sorry, sorry. sorry, very quickly, Alex. I, I, I'll just add, add one more in um, that people might not not remember from the last Ryder Cup, which was a Rory McIlroy shot. I think it was in the foursomes with Ian Poulter and, and the ball was in was in like a 
a ditch and the ball was way below McElroy's feet. And I remember, you know, we're lucky we're commentating on Five Live. We, we walk inside the ropes. I remember walking by the ball and just thinking as a club golfer, oh my God, that is, that is horrendous. And he'd got, he then got to get it over water onto a green that was surrounded by trees. And there was no way you could conceive of, of doing anything other than just bunting the ball out onto the fairway and then taking your chances from there. And then McElroy managed to put this ball onto the green. And honestly, it, I, I remember saying in commentary, I think that's the greatest golf shot I've ever seen. It was yeah. just extraordinary. And, it, and the only reason I tell that story is because, you know, we all like to think that we're playing the same game as the pros. Believe me, we most certainly are not. They see shots that we just simply cannot conceive of. And that was yeah. one of them. And back to the tenth of the Belfry, Bernard. Uh, I saw there's a European Tour video, I think, this year, and I think it was either Tyrrell Hatton or Danny Willett was trying to play the same shot with a persimmon yeah. driver from 300 yards. And eventually, I think Danny Willett put it on the green. Eventually, but it certainly wasn't take one. Um, no. So it just shows how good that shot was. Okay, but it wouldn't be with the same ball. No, of course not. Yeah. That ball, the ball Seve got the Seve, the ball that Seve used in those days, it's at least 20 yards shorter than the ball we play today. Okay, so it might still use a persimmon head and you have a good, decent, strong shaft. But the ball, the ball, it, you know, hitting the ball a long way today is a combination of the titanium head, the shaft, and the ball. It's a it's three things. That's why the ball manufacturers are getting themselves so annoyed about it, because it's not just the ball that hits the ball a long way. It's other factors. It's the fitness of the player. It's the titanium head, which, which has a bounce effect. It's big and it's light. And the shafts, the development in the shafts, the club head speed because of the shaft. It's three things. It's not just one. Yeah, of course. Um, all right. Well, last, last question um, for you guys, if possible. So uh, this one, I suppose, towards Bernard, I suppose. Um, do professional golfers enjoy playing as a team? Or do they enjoy playing as uh, singles? What do you think? Well, Ian can answer this one as well, but um, we, I only enjoy playing as a team in the Ryder Cup. Right. And the rest of the time, I like to lock myself away and play very individually and singly. And that's, it's, that question is related to an earlier question, to be honest, why there's camaraderie, camaraderie between the Americans and the Europeans. I've always felt the Americans are very single-minded and go about their business, don't have very much friendship between them. But I should have changed a little bit because Ricky Fowler, Justin Thomas and Jordan Spieth are all quite friendly and they go on holiday together. And that's something that's never happened in the past. But, but you know, the, the, the European side, um, you know, they, they, they're much, much less singly-minded for the reasons I said earlier, the way they travel. But uh, for me, um, I just, I, I'm lucky uh, that I enjoy my own company. And uh, I wouldn't say um, I enjoy my own company as maybe someone like Nick Faldo who enjoys his company even more than anybody else. But, uh, you know, I, 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 Annabelle Dimmock's a young golfer from Wentworth, a lady golfer, she's one on the European tour. And I said to her, you know, what's important to become a successful professional golfer is you've got to like your own company you can't go into the bars at night and th and, and, and you, you've got to go to your room and read a book or something like that and be prepared to play the next day and wait until you get home before you you get together with your mates because I've seen it all too much in the past players going out they, they get lonely in their room and, and they go out and, and it just something it just leads to something else You've got to be very dedicated. It's a short golfing life and you've, you've got to be very dedicated and like your own company. I always think that's a very important aspect of being a successful professional golfer. Yeah, okay. And I, Thank I, you I think, much for that. Yeah, I, I think, Alex, that the, and maybe this is, this kind of sums it up in that the United States are the golfing superpower and that unites the rest of the world to try and beat them and in this case it's it's Europe I was lucky enough to be in Ohio just the week before last for the Solheim Cup the women's equivalent of the Ryder Cup and I thought that Europe stood no chance whatsoever when I got there there were no spectators the travel bans in place there were no friends and family and they were substantially ranked lower than the Americans and yet 
well, by the time they teed off, I thought, you know what? I think Europe are going to do this because yeah. you could just see the way the players had each other's backs. They were motivated to beat America. And I think that is something that Europe always get. And that's what they've got to take to Wisconsin next week. And they could, if they do that, they could spring another surprise in the same way as the women. Let's hope so. I think it'll be. Well, let's hope so. Absolutely. Um, and on that, on that note, guys, go on. Bernard. Just one, one thing to finish going on about the Solheim. If the Ryder Cup next week's half as good as the Solheim Cup, then we're in for a treat. And one of my, one of my, and I thought Leona Maguire, the Irish girl who played, was the most fantastic performance from any Solheim Cup player, any Ryder Cup player I've ever seen. She single-handedly won that Solheim Cup by her play in the foursomes, the four ball, and especially in the singles. She was an inspiration to Katrina Matthews and it was fantastic to watch. She was like the Seve and Ian Poulter put together. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was great to watch. And uh, of course, we hope Europe win next week. It's a big ask, I think. And uh, as I said, I'm on the team with the players on Monday, the charter play to, to Milwaukee. And uh, I don't want to say too much and be sent to Coventry. But, it, but it, you know, we don't have any supporters. We've got a course 8,000 yards long. And, uh, you know, this would be one of the great feats if we could bring this back. And uh, we, we mustn't forget that. And I hope they do. Of course, of course. Um, well, guys, that has been absolutely brilliant. Um, thoroughly enjoyable. Uh, I've been getting feedback on my phone as well while we've been going along saying this is amazing. Thank you ever so much for arranging. Um, but on behalf of myself, uh, obviously on behalf of Holborn uh, and everybody who's on the call today, thanks a lot for taking the time out, guys. Uh, thoroughly enjoyable. Jeremy, do you want to say any last words? Yeah, just two seconds. Uh, Alex, thank you very much for helping us put it together. And, and also thank you to Andrew Carter and the team in Cyprus for hosting us here. And also, Bernard, thanks very much for your time and, and the stories. Um, Ian knows how much I know about golf. Um, and you can't see him on the screen because he's probably scowling, but that's been brilliant. Certainly <laughs> for me. Um, but there's, there's many more people here that certainly do play golf um, uh, properly um, rather than hacking. So, so um, and we're hoping, as I mentioned before, we're hoping to do more of these um, in, the, in the, the particular season. So we're hoping to do something so maybe for the Autumn Internationals for Rugby. Ian, I might be um, uh, asking you to help us with that as well. So, so we'll, get, we'll get in touch soon. But no, thanks again. It's been really useful. Thank you. Cheers, Bernard. Great. Thanks, uh, thanks, Ian. Uh, Great thank pleasure. You everybody. Thank you. Cheers. I'll end the meeting. Thank you. Bye now. Thank you. Bye. All right. Very good.